Hi everyone, a very warm welcome to MPARC's One Million Trees webinar, nurturing the next generation of environmental stewards and educators' perspective. Thank you for joining us on Zoom and YouTube. My name is Rachel and I'll be your host for this afternoon. For our new viewers, the One Million Trees movement is a nationwide effort to plant one million trees across Singapore over 10 years, alongside the community. On top of our tree planting efforts, we also have an array of other activities and resources such as virtual tours. So do check out our website, TreesSG, and connect with us on our MPAC social media accounts for updates. In our last webinar, we had Dr. Sean Lan from NTU and Mr. Luo Ho Kyung from MPAC's National Biodiversity Centre share with us valuable insights in the, into the dynamic field of forest ecology. Do check out our past webinars on our NPARC's YouTube channel. Today, we'll be hearing from our speakers about the incredible journeys they've undertaken to nurture the younger generation into the environmental stewards of tomorrow. In addition to getting a glimpse into some of the exciting nature education programs we have in place in Singapore, we'll also be learning about how there's been a paradigm shift from a mere focus of environmental education taking place in the classroom to it being weaved into an entire school experience and culture. Without further ado, let me introduce our speakers for today. We have with us Ms. Go Patient, manager at MPARC's National Biodiversity Centre, who works with many schools to carry out habitat enhancement, biodiversity monitoring and outreach, and was herself a teacher previously. We are also very privileged to have with us Mr. Jacob Tan, senior teacher of biology at Commonwealth Secondary School, whose passion for the environment has transformed his school's culture campus, curriculum, and day-to-day -day practices. After their respective talks, we'll be having a short Q&A session. So do send whatever questions you have along the way to my colleague, Zestin, via private message on the Zoom chat. I hope you're as excited to hear from our speakers as I am. Patient, please. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. And thanks everybody for joining us on this OMT webinar on this rainy Saturday afternoon. So my name is Patien. I'm a manager from the Biodiversity Information and Policy Branch under National Biodiversity Centre. So a large part of um, our daily work is to engage the community to raise awareness and conserve our native biodiversity. So today, I'm going to share with you some of our efforts in nurturing the next generation environmental stewards. Right, so in the more recent years, Singapore has uh, adopted a biophilic design in restoring habitats. And while doing so, we are also actively engaging the community to sustain our greening efforts. So building upon what we have achieved previously as a city in a garden, we now aim to further restore nature into the urban fabric as we move towards becoming a city in nature. So under our new city in nature vision, we are enabling the community to forge a closer bond through active stewardship of the environment. So for example, community can now participate in the design and management of the parks and estates in Singapore. Um, and this is actually an extension of the MPARCS Friends of the Parks initiative. Some example of how the community can contribute would be um, designing the park signages or partnering the governors for landscape planting. And our city nature vision is supported by various other MPARCS initiatives. And our One Million Tree Movement is one such effort led by the community. This is launched uh, just last year in 2020, and it aims to restore nature back to the city by planting 1 million tree across Singapore over the next 10 years. And of course, we have our Community in Nature initiative, which was launched way back in year 2011. And this is a national movement to connect and engage communities in conserving Singapore's natural heritage. And what we are doing under um, CIN in short, um, it's aligned with MPARC's City and Nature Vision and the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. Alright, so there's a, one common point between all the efforts that I've just shared, which is community, and the heart of everything that we are doing is actually the community. So today's webinar will focus on how um, schools and youth can contribute to the One Million Tree Movement and also building our city and nature through participation in our community and nature activities. So under CIN, we have various activities that fits under these three main streams. 
First will be citizen science. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of this before, it's actually public participation in scientific research, which is conducted in whole or in part by amateur scientists guided by professionals in the field. Locally, usually how we carry out citizen science will be um, to involve the volunteers in data collection. Second stream will be habitat enhancement and species recovery. And some example of habitat enhancement will be activities like tree planting and building floating wetland. And the last stream that I have here will be nature outreach. And this is probably what we all are familiar with, educational programs such as guided tours, public talks, and outreach booth. Okay. And under CIM, we work with various community partners from other government agencies to uh, families and even passionate individuals. And today, sharing will focus on educational institution. And this is a list of the community and nature programs that we have targeting public and students of various, uh, various age group. We have six major programs here. And the first three, but are still for schools, greening schools for biodiversity and science communication for CRM ambassador. These are all targeting schools. And number four to six um, is open for all. And this table also shows how each program fits into the three CIM streams. And all these programs have a common goal, which is to connect, educate, and inspire diverse community to actively conserve and celebrate our natural heritage. And at the same time, when we are working with schools and working directly with youth, we are also cultivating champions within the community in protecting our natural, natural environment. So for this um, webinar, I will focus on the three highlighted programs, uh, which has habitat enhancement elements. All right, first up the list, we have Biodiversity Week for School. And this is actually a week long event in May. And we usually have it um, towards the end of May to commemorate the International Day of Biological Diversity on 22nd May. And under this week long program, we have four activities targeting various age groups. First one will be the Playtime series, and this is for the younger audience. Uh, preschools and lower primary students. So through an uh, interactive sticker book and a video, they get to learn about Singapore's biodiversity. Every year we have a different theme and we focus on different flora and fauna that we can find in Singapore. Next, we have BioBlades for schools and these are targeting the older students, upper primary and above. Um, BioBlades, um, for those of you who have heard this word for the first time, is actually a form of biodiversity survey, which aims to record as many species as possible within a set period of time in a particular location. So applying um, the school's contact, the student are required to conduct biodiversity survey within the school ground to record the commonly seen fauna within the campus. Then we have Green Wave. This is for all levels suitable for preschools and above. Um, students who participate in Green Wave will get to plant native trees and learn about the importance of conserving them. And all these activities, including the Biodiversity Week for community, which runs concur concurrently with Biodiversity Week for schools, will actually end in our biggest biodiversity event of the year, the Finale Festival of Biodiversity. And this is for those of you who have been to the festival, um, you'll know that it's a public festival at our heartlands, and we involve our community partners to showcase and raise awareness on Singapore's rich biodiversity. All right, so a little bit more on Green Wave. Um, the Green Wave program is actually an international program supported by the Convention of Biological Diversity, and it aims to bring children and youth together to, of course, raise awareness on the local biodiversity within the country and also to help them learn the importance of protecting our natural environment. So as part of the campaign, students around the world will plant locally important trees, either within their school compound or at the um, local area at 10 a.m. on 22nd May. So 22nd May, again, is the International Day of Biological Diversity. And because of the time zone difference, as everybody um, start planting at 10 a.m., it actually creates a symbolic green wave across the globe. So locally in Singapore, of course, we have given the schools more flexibility um, to carry out planting any day within the Biodiversity Week. 
Right. So um, on top of the trees or potter plant that we have provided for the school, so participating school who registered for this program can choose to have either trees or potter plant depending on the space availability they have within their campus. We will also provide uh, info kit with key information on the event itself and on each plant species. The plant species that we have chosen will usually be biodiversity attracting native plant. And using this info kit, the teachers can conduct a simple lessons for the student to help them learn more about all these um, native species before they do the planting. And when they are doing the planting, not only they are enhancing their school's habitat, they are also directly contributing to the one million tree movement. Okay, next up we have um, Greening Schools for Biodiversity. Uh, this is a higher commitment level program. It's a year-long program to involve students and teachers in enhancing their school's habitat through planting of native biodiversity attracting plants. And students who are involved in this program will be um, collecting data on the flora and fauna in school, the, uh, participating in the designing of the planting layout, carrying out greening activity, and also monitoring the biodiversity within the school. And eventually, at the end of the program, they are required to create a biodiversity trail within the school. And this program, as you can see, it actually touches um, all three CIM streams. And we have several different tracks that the school can choose from as well, starting from the most basic greening, which is planting of native biodiversity attracting plant within the school compound. And then uh, once they have completed this program and if they want to continue uh, this program for the second year, they can choose to embark on a different track, such as building or floating wetland to enhance their aquatic habitat, or even participating in the native plant conservation program. And this year, we have a very exciting new track, which is creating bee-friendly habitat. So the purpose of this new track is to help students and teachers um, have a little bit more understanding about these um, commonly misunderstood um, insects. Yeah. Okay. So every time a planting is done under this program, uh, again, the student not only enhances their school habitat, but they are also helping to restore nature back into our city, particularly the native species. So one advantage that Singapore has is that we live in close proximity to nature and highly likely that your school is also nestled within our green spaces. So in a broader picture, by greening out the school compound, your school will also serve as an ecological linkage by facilitating fauna movement between these green spaces. So ultimately, uh, in the long run, this is how everybody, uh, even young uh, children, can play a part in building our city and nature. So I believe that later on, uh, Mr. Jacob Tan will also share more on how their school has uh, been working on in this area. Okay, so uh, for the next few slides, I'm going to share a few examples from some of the schools that participated in this program. Uh, the first one will be Hogang Primary School. And as you can see on the photos on the left, this is a plot of a seemingly unusable space next to the school fence. But the teacher in the school has actually creatively converted this into a planting area by creating a raised bed using um, these black rubber strips that you can see here as barriers. And they actually became a very rich uh, planting ground for the school. And on these newly formed planting beds, they have planted mostly native plants, the attracting species. And they have been uh, doing so for the past 10 years or so. And right now, the school has actually transformed into a mini rainforest uh, on its own. Then we have Westwood Primary School. Um, the teachers from Westwood Primary School visited Hong Kong Primary School during one of our teachers' workshop, and she was very inspired to um, follow their footsteps. So what she has done is similar to Hong Kong Primary School. You can see in this photo that the students have also participated in planting along the school fence. And in order to enrich the experience, the teacher have created um, information panels for each, spe each species uh, along the way. So this information panel will also enhance the biodiversity trail within the school. So as students uh, visit this uh, native garden, they can also learn more about the users of each species. And then we have Telok Kurau Primary School 
who have uh, decided to start a butterfly garden in 2017 under the program and they have decided to do so after receiving suggestions from a group of their own students who attended a nature camp at Pulau Ubin. And you can see from this photo here that um, they are also making use of industrial waste, such as the old tires, which serve as planters in the garden. So on the picture on the right, you can see that the primary school kids themselves are actively involved in planting and also garden maintenance. Then we have Bukit Wheel Secondary School, uh, which has this empty plot of land, which they have decided to convert into a biodiversity garden. And this is part of a larger garden, which serves as an outdoor classroom for their environmental education module. And we have here um, Jiamin Primary School. They have this lovely little garden here, which um, before they joined the program, is actually planted up with mainly papaya trees. And after joining the program, they managed to bring in more native plants to print out um, this uh, lovely garden here. So you can see the before and after programs. This photo was taken a few years back. And by now, the little trees and shrubs that were planted then has already grown into a much uh, larger and larger mini rainforest. Okay, and lastly, we have this very interesting example here from Chongqing High School. They have, um, for those of, you, those of you who have visited Chongqing High School before, they have a very large, relatively large um, freshwater lake in the middle of the school. And the teacher have um, actually seen the opportunity for habitat enhancement and she went ahead and created floating wetlands to enhance the aquatic habitat in the school. Uh, so the first picture on the top left corner uh, is actually the first floating wetland created by the teachers and the students. Um, and you can see that it wasn't doing very well, but across time they improve on, uh, they learn how to take care of the plants and they even make a few uh, changes to the plants composition. And on the top right corner, you can see that the floating wetlands is already thriving. And after that, they have went on to install a few others uh, floating wetlands within the school. And interestingly, they have recorded an uh, increase in dragonfly species spotted in the school. Right, so that's all for our school program. Uh, we are, so I would like to emphasize that CIN not only caters to different age groups, but also um, different commitment level. So we have nationwide BioBlades um, habitat enhancement here. It's actually open to all members of public uh, in the month of May on registration basis. So interested schools can also actually write into us to participate. So those schools who are unable to participate in long-term school programs, uh, this is another avenue that they can contribute and they can participate in uh, once-off habitat enhancement activities such as tree planting, and building of floating wetland in selected nature area. And of course, because we are talking about BioBlitz, they can also join our staff in uh, conducting biodiversity survey for certain taxa in selected parks across Singapore. And the photo here shows a floating wetland constructed by uh, some schools and also member of public in Cambridge Park two years back. Okay, and lastly, I would like to share about our Youth at SG Nature Initiative. Uh, this is an initiative to bring together MPARC's existing and new program to provide youth uh, within the age of 16 to 25 years old with more platform to engage with nature, particularly in the field of landscape, horticulture, and biodiversity conservation. So under this uh, new initiative, we work with the Ministry of Education to incorporate nature-based activity into their outward bound Singapore camp. So every student who go through the camp will have an opportunity to learn more about biodiversity and take part in related activity. So we hope that these students will eventually grow to appreciate the natural heritage more and be inspired to conserve it. Then we have with us our um, Biodiversity Friends Forum, an existing platform and Green Friends Forum which just started um, second half of last year. So these are similar initiatives that provides a platform for youth to seek mentorship, um, skills development, and form relationships with like-minded youth who are interested in topics related to biodiversity, um, horticulture, and urban greenery. So this tool 
uh, initiative, BFF and GFF, has actually come together to organize uh, two new programs called the Youth Nature Explorer Program and the Youth uh, Steward for Nature. So for Youth Nature Explorer, we are targeting uh, youth 16 to 25 years old. This uh, mainly for those who want to, who are new to the scene and want to do a little bit more for the um, topics mentioned just now. So this, we have a selection of activity that youth can, can take part in and learn more about urban greenery and biodiversity in our city and nature. So the requirement is fairly simple. Interested youth can register with us and attend three activities in one year and eventually submit a photo report to us. And the admission is rolling. So if you, are, if you know anybody who are interested or if you yourself are interested, you can uh, go to our website and sign up for the Youth Nature Explorer program. And then we have the Youth Steward for Nature program. We are targeting a slightly different age group here, 18 to 25 years old. Um, eligible youth are, under this program are able to gain industry relevant experience. So um, they are able to assist in implementation of real world project under professional mentorship. And the requirement for this um, program is actually slightly more than Youth Nature Explorer. The youth under this program are required to complete a six month project in small groups of up to three and the estimated commitment level per week will be six to eight hours. Okay, right. So all in all, um, through working with schools and youth, one of the biggest challenges that uh, I feel is always time. So in schools and teachers will always need to juggle between different responsibility while ensuring that each and every students are well taken care of, both mentally and also academic academically. So for older students and even young working professionals, we also have to um, juggle between uh, different responsibility. So time is always the, the biggest concern and biggest challenge for us. So we tend to work around the availability of our target audience and be flexible in our programming. So Greenway Tree Planting is one of the very good examples. Instead of um, getting all the schools to plant on 10 a.m. on 22nd May, we actually gave them a week um, to, to carry out the planting. So by doing so, we are also providing participation opportunity for audience of different commitment level. So what I've learned um, from working with the community is that um, passion always drives people forward and it can be very contagious. So being able to work directly with teachers and youth is a very humbling experience. Um, they are the basis of our society and because teachers play such a large part in molding our future generation. And these future generations are the ones that will eventually grow up to form the core of our society. So often I find that it's their passion, it's the passion of these teachers and youth that kept us moving forward and be inspired to keep improving on what we are doing. So for the many years to come, we hope to continue engaging uh, the teachers and the youth and in time reach out to as many people as possible to achieve our city and nature vision. Yeah, so that's the end of my sharing. I hope you learned something from it. And for more information on our community and nature program, please visit our website or write to us at cim at mpass.gov.sg. I'll pass my time back to Rachel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patien, for giving us such a comprehensive overview on how schools can get on board this very important task of cultivating a love for nature in the next generation. I shall now pass the time on to Jacob, who will be sharing with us Commonwealth Secondary's journey in environmental education. Jacob, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, on this uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'm the senior teacher for biology. All right, uh, once again, good afternoon to everyone. 
Uh, today I'm going to share with you my school's journey in uh, environmental education. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'm the senior teacher for biology uh, in Commonwealth Secondary School. And uh, I'm really honored to speak uh, on behalf of my school uh, to share with you the journey. Uh, I believe that uh, many of you in the audience are either educators or people who believe in education being the key driver to nat nature conservation. And I'm glad that you are joining us today. Uh, I love working with MPARCs as a teacher because uh, especially uh, there are people like a patient who, are, who, who, who was a teacher as well. So she could understand the constraints and even the opportunities that the school offers. So um, this allows a, a bet better flexibility uh, when it comes to working with schools. And um, I just want to mention that Singapore has moved from beyond the initial vision of a garden city to become a city in garden and in the next 10 years to be a city in nature. And um, as a school, we believe that our school is like a microcosm of uh, Singapore and um, where all of us in the school, we are, we are living in, the, we, are, we are coming to the school that uh, does not just look at greening, but look at how our staff and students can actually coexist and live with nature and play a part in, um, in, in nature and wildlife conservation. And we believe that as a school, as we raise the awareness on local flora and fauna, our school can be an inspiration to other schools to nurture the next generation of environmentally conscious citizens. And for me as a bio teacher, I believe that as I teach, um, that there's a joy in me when I see my students uh, having the awe and wonder of the intricacy of life and nature. And as a school, we have uh, a vision for environmental education. We believe that uh, our approach uh, is one that is impactful and we want our students to not just encounter nature once a year through an event, but we want the students to come into a school in nature. And this is our mission as a school. We believe that our students can be champions of today and leaders of tomorrow. And each of them uh, will champion a cause that is worthy. And one of them uh, could be a cause that is regarding nature. And this is our vision that we want our students to be a confident learner, imaginative trailblazer and compassionate leader. And this can be done through many programs. And uh, today I'm sharing with you um, one that is uh, regarding environmental education. Uh, this is how our school looks like and uh, for the past uh, many years we have uh, started in uh, habitat enhancement and our school has come a long way uh, for environmental education since 2008 and uh, in 2012 we started uh, habitat enhancement on our campus uh, transforming our campus into a safe haven for wildlife and a perfect classroom to learn about coexistence between human and wildlife. And we have made uh, many um, uh, nature encounters part of a daily experience for the students uh, in the school. And over the years, you can see how our uh, eco habitats have matured and we have seen many different uh, new visitors coming to the school, such as monitor lizards, uh, blue winged pita, black beetle, and even a reticulated python last year. And we believe that uh, we can get, uh, we can use every teachable moments that we have to educate our school population on treating our wildlife with compassion and allow them to thrive in our urban landscapes. So this is our 13th year uh, on environmental education. And these are the partners that uh, we work with. And especially with MPAX, uh, we are on board on the Greening Schools for Biodiversity Program, which allow us to be connected to uh, many uh, um, experts and, and uh, passionate people to come in and share with our students uh, what is happening in Singapore. In our school, we have uh, five areas that we look at in terms of sustainability. So one of it is nature conservation. Uh, we have food security, clean energy, water resources, and sustainable lifestyle. So these five areas are areas that we feel will give the students a holistic view of uh, sustainability in Singapore. So for today, I will share with you about the nature conservation area in our school, that it is more than just greening up the school. We believe that uh, we are a school in nature and in, in order to become a school in nature, we want to let our students and staff 
to coexist and live with nature and play a part to be stewards and custodians of our nature and uh, wildlife. This is MPARC's uh, Nature Conservation Master Plan. And uh, since uh, we need to find a way to start off, uh, we refer to these four areas uh, as we go about uh, designing our school program. So first of all, we have conservation of key habitats. So uh, I mean, as a school, we, we don't really start off with a, a, a habitat. So we, we create uh, these habitats. So we have gardens by the corridor, which is outside the staff room at level three. We have indoor garden showcasing plants that do not need direct sunlight. We have the stream, uh, slow flowing uh, water body in the school. We have a uh, saltwater ecology, um, marine aquarium. We have the rainforest between the two classroom blocks. We have the wetland that uh, that is uh, receiving uh, rainwater. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's not a salt, saltwater uh, wetland. And in terms of uh, habitat enhancement, restoration and species recovery, uh, we do our best as a school to uh, to be part of this as well. Uh, this is a photo taken from uh, my wife's yearbook when she was studying on this campus. Uh, this campus was uh, used by River Valley High School uh, and this photo was from 2004. And in 2006, after uh, years of uh, habitat enhancement, uh, we have converted the school into, uh, this area of the school into a rainforest. Yeah, from a grass patch to a, a forest garden. And because of our long-standing relationship with MPAX, uh, through the Community in Bloom and Community in Nature programs, uh, we are able to uh, receive uh, many different uh, staff from MPAX to come to the school to share with the students on native plants and uh, non-native plants and, and get, the, get the students uh, involved in planting some of them. Uh, we also have a group of students that uh, has a program called the Yellow Boots. Thursday, where they don on their yellow boots to uh, do some uh, nursery work in our school. So uh, there was once uh, last year, there was one day that I went to Pasapanja Nursery uh, to collect some uh, uh, excess seeds that they have in their nursery. And uh, I brought it back to the school and uh, let a few students uh, peel off uh, the coating uh, that, that surrounds the seed. And, and after that, uh, I, I got some students to uh, count them as well. Eventually, uh, we want to, uh, eventually we planted these seeds in our plant nursery in the school. Uh, we believe that this will help to maximize the, the seed uh, viability and give them a better chance uh, to survive uh, rather than leaving them uh, uh, just uh, lying around. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so uh, you can see some of these numbers. Uh, these are numbers uh, uh, generated because I have a group of students to count the number of seeds. So before we plant them, we actually count uh, how many seeds do we plant uh, because later on we can see how many of them actually germinated. Yeah, so this is a picture of uh, part of our plant nursery. Yeah, so uh, once uh, these seeds germinate, uh, we get uh, students to um, transfer them into the black planter bags to give them more space to, to grow. Yeah, and, and from the from the process of germination and, and then transfer the transferring the seedling, the students could understand why human intervention is sometimes uh, important and necessary to propagate some of these endangered uh, native plants. Uh, and, and some of them are even uh, locally extinct. Yeah, so uh, for some of the plant, uh, there's one that we planted 374 seeds and eventually only two of them uh, germinated. Yeah, so the student could, could really see uh, well, the reason why certain plants are really hard to propagate. This is a list of uh, plants that are uh, native endangered plants that we are uh, having in our plant nursery at the moment. And we will continue to see them through and uh, grow them into a uh, a bigger tree saplings before they are actually planted out. Yeah, so um, we wish that all these trees will eventually uh, be ready to be planted out in the school ground, uh, in our nature parks, nature way, or even nature reserves uh, to play our part in the 1 million trees movement uh, that was announced last year. 
And uh, within our school, because of uh, the COVID-19 situation, we couldn't bring the student out to plant uh, the plants that they have uh, grown from seeds. So we got them to plant uh, within the school itself. Yeah, so it's a picture of uh, students uh, planting out the saplings that they have grown from the seeds, taking care of them and seeing them growing bigger and bigger. And because of the habitat enhancement, uh, uh, we, we, we started to see wildlife coming into the school as well. So as a school, we need to deal with uh, wildlife and human uh, encounters. So uh, here are some examples of uh, wildlife coming into our school. And as we attract biodiversity, as, as we plant biodiversity, attracting plants and, and create uh, habitats, uh, we must be ready as a school to welcome this wildlife into the school. Yeah, so uh, myself and another teacher, we were sent uh, to a wildlife rescue workshop so that we can become an in-house uh, wildlife rescue uh, officer uh, whenever we have um, wildlife that needs to be relocated to another part of the school. So this is a monitor lizard outside the library. And um, we also have monitor lizard that, that roam around at different parts of the school. We have birds that uh, nest on structures that, um, that, that uh, we, we usually would not expect the birds to nest. Yeah, so this is a set of uh, street soccer goalposts that was cordoned off uh, to allow the birds to uh, finish the nesting period yeah, before it could be used for PE lessons. Um, this is the floorball goalpost outside the hall. Uh, the sunbird came to build a nest and same thing, we also uh, cordoned off the area so that uh, the nesting period can be completed uh, while making it a teachable moment for the rest of the school by uh, putting some notices uh, to, to explain what's going on. Uh, so students in the school can see a nesting process uh, up close uh, like what we see uh, on this picture. And another uh, bird species that frequent our school will be the pink and green pigeon. Yeah, so uh, you can see the different uh, progress of uh, the uh, the process of seeing through the young, and eventually on after the eighth day after the hatch, uh, the the students couldn't find the birds anymore because they have learned how to fly. Start of last year in January, we had an encounter with a. Uh, reticulated python. So it was outside uh, a corridor. It was along the corridor and uh, our operation manager, our OM, uh, managed to get it down, put it in a trash bag and uh, and uh, pass it to me and asked me to handle it. Yeah. So uh, what I did was to bring the trash bag, uh, well, to, was to bring the python to my principal office and ask uh, for permission for the python to be relocated to another part of the school. Uh, so um, this was a picture of the the, the particular reticulated python that we uh, released it back to one of our eco-habitats in the school, uh, knowing that it is an uh, important part of our ecosystem. So these are stories that we share with the students to let them know how we handle uh, uh, nature encounters. And uh, rather than, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I've heard of <laughs> maybe some, some in some of unfortunate cases, uh, snakes are cute. Uh, in, in, in the compound because of a misunderstanding of uh, the level of threat that they pose. We have a golden tree snake uh, that is found along the fourth level of a classroom block as well. So uh, same thing, uh, it was uh, uh, relocated to one of our eco habitats as well. So uh, as a teacher uh, in the school for the past 10 and a half years, I've been uh, creating my own uh, natural heritage of the school by uh, faithfully documenting every encounter of uh, wildlife that we have in the school. So this is uh, a list of uh, encounters of snakes uh, uh, within and also outside the school as well. So one interesting one would be the one uh, that is found in the canteen vending machine when the contractor came to uh, uh, replace the canned drinks and he was just stunned by uh, the presence of the snake in the vending machine. Yeah, so um, he, he couldn't uh, continue his work and another teacher came to uh, relocate the snake for him so that he can uh, continue what he is supposed to do. So uh, as a school, uh, we, we feel that uh, it is to become a nature, a, a school in nature, it is more than just greening up. Uh, we also have to change our mindset to be ready to embrace more uh, frequent uh, wildlife encounter. And 
all in all is a whole school's approach to be in sync with nature. It's not just a, a one teacher effort, but it has to be understood by the school leaders, uh, by the operation manager in, in the school as well, uh, so that we are all in sync on what to do, what is the protocol uh, in terms of landscaping, instead of trimming of plants, uh, in, in, in the case of uh, fogging in the school as well. In terms of uh, research and uh, conservation biology, we have a group of students studying this uh, in-house uh, non-examinable subject that the school uh, is running. It's called a STEM elective. So this subject has a slant towards uh, sustainability to let the students understand how uh, to innovate uh, for, for a sustainable Singapore. So these are the four areas that uh, are, con are included in the subject. And uh, we managed to get the support of different agencies and even ministries uh, to help us uh, come up with this uh, uh, totally new uh, subject in the school. So we managed to get uh, different people to come into our school to share with our students some uh, knowledge that they would not have. Uh, we had uh, Mr. Lim Liang Jing, uh, group director of the National Biodiversity Center, who gave an uh, assembly talk from our library and it was broadcast to the classroom uh, where all the students are, uh, are located. So he was sharing about the city nature vision and uh, at the end of his visit, we also got him uh, and some of the NPARC staff to plant uh, uh, endangered trees in our school as well. Uh, we also get uh, Dr. Andrew Lu, uh, Adrian Lu, uh, Group Director of Conservation and Wildlife Management, uh, to share with the students about a biophilic Singapore. And uh, for Acres, we got uh, Raj to come to share with the students about how to uh, be uh, live in harmony with our native wildlife. We have Ruben from the Native Plant Center sharing with the students about stories of how uh, the efforts that uh, that the that, that he has gone uh, and he and his colleague has gone to actually make sure that uh, the endangered trees are uh, able to be propagated and then uh, transplanted to different parts of Singapore. We have Pei Rong from uh, MBC as well. So she was sharing with the students that uh, MPAX is not just green, but blue as well. There are many wildlife uh, in our urban waters as well, even though uh, our waters are very busy with uh, many uh, tradings going on. Uh, we have Sunshine, uh, Deputy Director of uh, Pulau Ubin, who shared with the students on how water is being managed on Pulau Ubin, uh, how water is being managed for the use for people, and also how water is also conserved for nature as well. So uh, in our zoo itself, we also have many opportunities to let the students investigate uh, in nature. So uh, the students can get a chance to look at water qualities at different parts different parts of the school and use the different areas in the school as their outdoor classroom. Uh, we have different fruit trees in the school as well for the students to see the different types of flowers that goes beyond the examples that they could find in the textbook. Uh, not just uh, science and biology, but uh, humanities as well. Uh, our geography teachers also brings uh, their students out to the outdoor area to uh, do observation as well. Yeah, and uh, there are many opportunities because of our uh, outdoor environment that the teachers could tap on uh, to make use of the environment uh, towards their different subject disciplines. So uh, be it learning measurements or learning about history of how certain plants uh, came to Singapore, uh, that, that, that the learning is, can be very rich. Uh, when we have such an environment. Okay, um, we also get the students to do projects like taking videos, explaining about symbiotic relationships, uh, prey and predator relationships within the school. So uh, the school uh, eco-habitat provides such an environment for the students to actually make use of uh, what they can see every day uh, in their learning as well. Uh, for BioBleeds, a uh, patient mentioned just now, uh, how uh, schools are involved in serving the number of uh, the types of birds, butterflies, dragonflies uh, within the school. So uh, this gives the students the opportunity to learn how to put a name to that organism and not just uh, mentioning as a, a, a red dragonfly or a, a yellow butterfly. 
every year we also receive a tree, uh, a, a locally uh, a critical tree that is uh, given by M Parks, yeah, to uh, to plant the tree on this day, uh, where we celebrate the Green Wave uh, movement, and uh, we also have workshop. While uh, you can see a patient in the picture, uh, teaching the students about the common dragonflies and damselflies in Singapore, so uh, it is great that uh, we are able to uh, run this workshop within the school uh, for a particular group of students, either a, a particular CCA or subject or uh, interest group. Yeah, so uh, what's best is that they can use the school environment to uh, to apply their knowledge from the workshop and start identifying these species on their own. In terms of uh, our community stewardship and outreach in nature, um, our, our students uh, convinced the cleaners to bring the fallen leaves that they sweep uh, all around the school uh, towards the leaf litter compost that's beside our nursery. So uh, our canteen store holders and the students also contribute their kitchen waste uh, to this area, to this compost. Yeah, so uh, every week, uh, students uh, will be turning this uh, pile of leaves and, and mix with kitchen compost and bringing them out to different parts of the school to create uh, uh, rings of mulches around the trees in the school. So this provides uh, nutrients for the trees and also it uh, enhances the soil uh, quality as well. Uh, we also uh, keep uh, species that uh, die in our school. So we have our own uh, museum of uh, grasshoppers, birds, um, butterflies, dragonflies, so that uh, once a year during the, the biodiversity week for schools, uh, we bring them out to the canteen uh, to have the eco club students to share with the rest of the school on uh, what was cited in the school and allow the rest of the school to have a closer look at these species. We gladly host uh, schools from primary schools and secondary schools. Uh, we host them uh, to share with them our journey as well. Uh, international schools, we also share our knowledge with uh, teachers from other schools as well who organize a staff trip uh, with their principal, vice principals, uh, staff team to, to see how a uh, school in nature looks like. Uh, we also reach out to uh, the NIE where uh, we see the future teachers being trained and uh, we encourage them to uh, bring this vision towards their school as well as they uh, get posted to their new school. Um, so such uh, sharing allows them to see how uh, all these things could happen in the school context. And uh, the students also get a chance uh, whenever we host uh, visitors, uh, they also get a chance to speak to different groups of audience so that they learn how to uh, uh, code switch between uh, how, how do they pitch uh, their their nature guiding uh, experience for them. Uh, and at the national level, we are given a chance to uh, set up booth uh, at the Festival of Biodiversity in 2019, uh, where uh, our president uh, was uh, the guest of honor for that year. Yeah, so the students got a chance to share with the, um, the public as well uh, on what we do in the school. Uh, today marks the 100th uh, formal presentation that I give since 2014 uh, on our school's journey. And uh, what I want to end off is these five tips in building a school in nature. Uh, first of all, I want to encourage the teachers to do it, okay? to, to do uh, uh, what, uh, what is placed in your heart uh, if it sparks joy in you. Yeah, so I, I, I believe that uh, when you do that, you can grow your passion. Um, you don't do it because uh, you are being told to do so because it's a job description. Uh, if it happens to be, then uh, it's very good. Uh, you, you, can, you can make this part of uh, what, you, uh, what you need to do as a teacher. But if there's no such opportunity at the moment, if it sparks joy in you, uh, do it first uh, to the ability that you can. Uh, eventually, when the stars are aligned, um, uh, perhaps it can eventually be uh, part of uh, your official job scope as well. Second point, to engage the stakeholders in our schools. Uh, we cannot run away with working with our school leaders, uh, our, our OM, because uh, when it comes to certain issues, we have to, uh, we have to uh, make a, a, a school's decision uh, together uh, so that it's coherent uh, for the rest of the school population. So uh, it's important to engage uh, 
them uh, build our school's uh, natural heritage uh, by having Instagram, emails, or newsletter. So these are some examples of hashtag that are used uh, to archive uh, and document our uh, nature encounters and uh, be connected with like-minded uh, like educators uh, by joining uh, some of the programs that uh, patients have shared so that you can uh, continue to learn and, and grow. And lastly, um, we need to transfer uh, from a school experience into a school culture because uh, eventually um, we, we will not be in that school forever. So hopefully before any one of us who are passionate about nature leaves the school, uh, we are actually able to um, uh, let it be something that is part of a school's identity, uh, a school culture. So that will make this uh, school in nature vision uh, last uh, beyond our time in the school. So I've come to my end of uh, my sharing and I'll pass the time back to Rachel. Uh, Rachel, you need to unmute uh, yourself. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Jacob, for your very inspiring sharing. It's so encouraging to see how your efforts have gone such a long way in shaping the mindsets of your students and your school's culture as well. Uh, we shall now move on to our Q&A session. So thank you to all in the audience who have submitted questions. We have received quite a few questions, so I apologize in advance if we are un unable to cover every single one of them. Our first question is, how can teachers incorporate nature education into their lessons? Okay, so for this, I hope uh, through my presentation, uh, there can be some answer to it. It can either be a uh, part of a CCA, it can be part of uh, your subject discipline. Uh, there's always a way to um, find a way to uh, craft it into your uh, the, the, the learning outcomes that you need to deliver. Yeah, so I would encourage every teacher to uh, to really uh, yeah, really really try your best to, to see how, how uh, it can actually turn up in your lesson. I maybe just to add on to what Jacobs has uh, just shared. So part of um, a lot of the program that I shared um, early on in my presentation, actually, um, when we plan for all this program, we had MOE curriculums in mind. So for example, take playtime series uh, uh, as an example, teachers can, can uh, preschool teacher and lower primary school teacher can um, easily use that as a regular lessons. Uh, once a year, at least for their students to learn about um, the plants and animals in Singapore. And then um, for activities, other activities like BioBliss and um, creating schools for biodiversity, we also have teachers who are doing this activity with their own class uh, and incorporating them into their science lessons. So I think these are all the opportunities that teachers can tap on easily. Thank you for sharing. Our second question is, how can we measure the success of nature education programs? Uh, I think for me, uh, uh, I, it's, it's quite hard to have a rubric to, 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 uh, to, to do this. Uh, but from what I see, uh, I'm encouraged to have students uh, sending me photos of them uh, going to the nature parks in Singapore. And whenever they see any uh, they, whenever they have any wildlife encounter, uh, some of them will actually uh, take picture of it and send it to me and just say that that reminds uh, them of their time in our school. So that's uh, for, for me, that is a, a, a kind of success that I uh, experience. Uh. Okay, um, for me, I think um, also tapping on my past experience when I was in school, uh, not everything can be measured quantitatively. So this is one of the examples that we have to see it um, as a qualitative measure. So uh, while working with teachers uh, through the Community and Nature program, I think some of the feedback that I've gotten would be um, simple things like um, my students are able to name the butterfly that they've seen in the butterfly garden now and being able to call out that the yellow bird is actually an olive back sunbird as compared to just a yellow bird. And I think it's um, basically when we want to measure the success of nature education program, it's a little bit like we are, we are planting the tree. 
So if you sow that seed today, you don't expect it to grow into a big tree tomorrow. It's a, it's a whole process and we have to put our heart into it. So it's these little things like being able to name a plant or, or an animal uh, in their surrounding. Actually, um, these little things brings them closer to, to nature. And when they are able to do that, that means um, being teachers, you have done something right. You are able to already teach them uh, all these things uh, that they used to ignore around them. Yeah, so, so I guess uh, there's no direct answer to this, but just observing uh, what your students uh, have learned would be kind of how we can measure the success of all these programs. Yeah. I believe that uh, as uh, my, my students, uh, when they, in the past, when they see uh, uh, maybe a bee that, uh, that just came into the classroom and just trying to find its way out, they'll be using their textbook to try to swipe the bee. But nowadays, they know that uh, that might cause more harm to themselves. So uh, they have learned that uh, they, they will actually need to switch off the fan first. And that will actually give uh, the bee uh, a lesser F air movement so that the bee can actually uh, find its way out. And, and to understand that the bee doesn't want to be part of the lesson, but it's just uh, venturing into a wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, so I think uh, this can be seen by how uh, students and teachers respond to every uh, encounter uh, in the school. Thank you. Our next question is, what are some of the challenges faced in motivating students to care for the environment and how can we overcome them? Mm, I think um, towards the end of my presentation, I shared that time is always the, the, the biggest challenge uh, for, for students because uh, often they will uh, have to juggle among so many responsibilities. So we know that students nowadays um, after school, they still have so many extracurricular activity and also um, tuition that they have to attend and uh, uh, what is it? Uh, supplementary lessons and all the other things that they have, they have to do outside the school. So um, yeah, so that would, I think that would be the biggest challenge. And in order to be able to uh, motivate them, I think also going back to what I shared earlier, they have to first uh, learn how to notice wise around them. So perhaps just uh, putting down their phone and looking wise what they have in their surrounding, uh, start to observe all the plants and animals they have around them. Then over time, they might develop a passion towards them. Yeah. And also, uh, we are living in such an extraordinary time. Uh, and I have to say that we have uh, developed a series of virtual tours, videos that the students can easily access from their home as well. So all these are, um, are also sort of the channel that the students can tap on to, to, to learn more about what we have. Yeah. Mm, I, I, I agree with what patients say, time. Uh, yeah, a lot of people will say, yeah, where do you find that time yeah, to, for the students? So uh, rather than doing nothing, we just do uh, what we can, uh, be it just a small group of five students, uh, we are still making an impact. Yeah, but of, of, of course, along the way, we have to see how we can merge, uh, I mean, where we can find uh, pockets of time or, uh, to engage our students, or even not just be limited by a subject or by CCA, but uh, simply uh, be uh, weave it into part of a school experience, a school identity that is not being constrained by a particular part of the uh, textbook or particular part of the year that uh, is actually a, a, a all year round, uh, anytime it can happen and we just uh, uh, make that story uh, a, a teachable one for the rest of the school Yeah, by, by writing up into a story to, to inform uh, the rest of the school that this, uh, this incident of uh, a bird coming into the class is actually, has actually happened uh, like yesterday yeah, so that will get more people aware and eventually uh, interested to see how they can uh, play a part as well. Mm, and uh, maybe just like on teachers among the audience, you are very powerful because students look up uh, upon you and what you, are do, what you have incorporated into a lesson will eventually influence them. So at these days and age, perhaps also we can do like what Jacob has done to use social media to engage your students. So I guess this will also motivate them to care for the environment, yeah. 
Oh yeah, I, I want to mention that uh, I'm 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 also in charge of the school's uh, social media posts. So uh, I I also have uh, the ability to also pass on some of this message through the posts that I, I I do. Yeah, so uh, most of the students will have uh, follow the school's official channel, uh, official uh, Instagram. So uh, when I mean, I, I try my best to get uh, this information onto their newsfeed by posting some of these things uh, happening in the school in the school's uh, Instagram account, so that um, yeah, so that they, they also it, it becomes part of their uh, the the things that they encounter on their Instagram or, or other it's social media. Phone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we were always as teachers, they are thinking of a way to infiltrate into um, their their area of interest. Yeah, so this can be a quite an interesting way to to go about. Yeah, and and I think in terms of measurement, you can see the number of likes and views uh, that can be quite encouraging as well. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. With that, we've come to the end of our webinar. I'd like to thank Jacob and Patient again for taking the time today to share so generously with us. And also a big thank you to our audience on Zoom and YouTube for joining us today. Yeah, with the One Million Trees movement, we aim to reach out to even more young people to cultivate in them a sense of environmental stewardship. We will also be working even more closely with schools and other community groups to intensify greening in our urban areas, enhance habitat connectivity, and carry out and promote nature conservation together as a nation. The One Million Trees movement is growing strong, but we will need even more hands on deck. To join us and be a part of the movement, do find out more on our Trees SG website at the link shown here, and also sign up for our One Million Trees mailing list. Do also connect with us on our MPAC social media channels. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, Twitter, and YouTube. For specific inquiries and uh, initiatives, do also feel free to write in to us at the email address shown here, and we'll be happy to get back to you. A million thanks to all for joining us today. Do look forward to our next One Million Trees webinar, Forest Restoration in Action, that will be taking place on 20th March this year. See you all then and have a great evening.